I will um, very pleasantly excuse me, introduce uh, our next conversation, which is a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. Well, it is, in fact, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and it's a conversation that will bridge us from this question of gastronomy to um, the, the next panel after this conversation on hospitality. And that is um, a conversation between two people who have done a lot of thinking about uh, the transition of food in America um, at the highest levels and around the world. Adam Sachs, who is editor-in-chief of Saveur magazine, an award-winning journalist, uh, bon vivant and galloping gourmet. And <laughs> Will Guidara, who is the other half, um, some say the, the better half, depending on who asks, of the Daniel Hum and Will Guidara team at 11 Madison Park, Michelin three-star restaurant, number one in the world on the world's 50 best restaurant. And they're going to have this conversation about the art of emotion in fine dining, which we heard a lot about in this conversation. Please welcome to the stage. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam. I'm the editor of uh, Savour magazine. I hope I pronounced that correctly. If you're wearing a headpiece, just give me a thumbs up if I, if I said Savour correctly or give me some advice afterwards. Uh, happy to be here talking with uh, my friend Will, who you have a restaurant and you just rep repainted it or you, you remodeled it. What did you? Uh, <laughs> don't answer that. Okay, Will, Will and Daniel come from the school of if it's not broken, if it ain't broken, just burn it down to the studs and re rebuild from scratch for reasons that would take too long to go into uh, for you. But we were, we were talking about um, the, the renovation and, the, and the, the rethinking of the restaurant, the reimagining of it. You started to tell me a little bit about what the physical and, and menu changes mean for uh, for the service, and I, I thought you were going to say it was it w meant that you had to get more serious in some ways, but you used a phrase that sort of startled me in a way, and maybe it shouldn't have. You said that it, it, the new restaurant meant that you had to double down on the casualness of service. So what does that mean to d double down on the casualness? Yeah, so um, first of all, uh, welcome to New York. We're really excited that you guys are here, and I thank for everyone, Nicola, and the whole group to to bring so many awesome people to our city. It feels really good, and uh, we're excited to have you in our home, so welcome. I meant to say that. Too. No, 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 I'm just, <laughs> you're the editor, I'm the hospitality guy. Uh, so first, I think it's important, before we get into kind of the rebirth of 11 Madison Park, to talk about our birth to begin with. And, and when I say our, it's because I am, as uh, Mitchell said, just one half of a team, um, and it's Daniel Hume and I together that run that restaurant, and it's uh, because of his perspective on this exact topic that I feel I've been able to grow to the point where I'm able to be on this stage in front of you right now. Um, I never wanted to be in fine dining. In fact, anyone who ate a cheeseburger earlier, that's what I wanted to do. I had worked for Danny Meyer for a long time, and I really wanted to go and work at Shake Shack. Pre-IPO? Pre-IPO. I would be uh, wearing much more expensive clothes right now had I pursued that path, perhaps. Uh, and they were reinventing 11 Madison Park, and Daniel Hume was brought on to be the chef, and uh, the company asked me to go down and work there with him. Um, Daniel Hume had worked at you know some of the greatest restaurants in Switzerland, and prior to coming to New York, had earned four stars at Campton Place. And he was brought in to elevate the restaurant to uh, what it had the ability to be. That room is special. Um, and it was everyone's belief that the restaurant inside of it deserved to be one of the best. But while Daniel was pushing the envelope of excellence in the kitchen, um, it was believed that someone who, who came out of the Danny Meyer group and really understood hospitality needed to go in there to counterbalance that, such that um, we were always being sure to push hospitality alongside excellence. Those two things, they, they don't often go together. Um, it's very easy to be excellent if you're scaring people into never missing a detail or to care about all the rules. Um, but it's very unlikely when that is the case that people are gonna bring their most fully realized selves into the dining room. You, uh, you mean the, the staff? The staff, yeah. And so that idea of casualness was something that you and Daniel discussed from the beginning, from the well, first iterations of? No, I'm, I'm gonna get to the casualness thing. I'm just taking my own path. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <Very> casual. <laughs> 
And then it's also easy for people to be hospitable if you're just telling them how great they are all the time, but it's inevitable that they're probably gonna make a lot of mistakes. And so the idea that we set off to achieve in the very, very beginning was that, that we wanted a restaurant that was driven by both the kitchen and the dining room that uh, aspired for excellence and hospitality simultaneously and his ability to uh, recognize that service is just as important as the food has been the thing that kind of got us started. Now, as it comes to, to casualness, we have a very interesting relationship with the word perfect. In many ways, we aspire for perfection. Um, but in many other ways, we recognize that the idea of imperfection is sometimes one of our strongest uh, qualities. Um, we talk about it even as it pertains to leadership. Um, there's so many people that they become managers in our industry and they want to present themselves to their staff as being perfect. But we try to inspire in our teams the need to be vulnerable. Because inevitably, you want to follow the person that you could see yourself one day becoming, and we all know that we're innately imperfect. So we try to encourage our leaders to be vulnerable about their imperfections because it's much more easy to follow someone that you can see a little bit of yourself in. And so it is in that imperfection that we started to learn kind of about the guest experience and recognize the very things that we want to create when people walk through our doors. How, talk about that imperfection because I, I don't think casualness by your definition in service means spilling wine on someone or <laughs> misidentifying or giving someone who's allergic to shellfish the wrong dish. How do you encourage people to be Im imperfect in a charmingly perfect way? Well, no, I think when we talk about it, it's about learning all of the rules that we have over the years and then identifying which ones we should be breaking in pursuit of that connection. Um, what we were talking about when we first opened the restaurant. So we just designed our, our restaurant. We just opened. It is beautiful. It is so much more perfect than the room was before. We, we got there and it was meant to be a brasserie and we evolved the experience into a fine dining restaurant, but it was still in a brasserie. The food is, is probably more perfect in its plating right now than it's ever been. And we sat down the day before we opened to the public and we had a meal and every single I was dotted and every single T was crossed and we were nervous. We were nervous that uh, fine dining can already be so overwhelming and intimidating to our guests that people now were gonna walk into an even more beautiful, even more perfect room, seeing even more perfect food and they would have an inability to relax. They would have an inability to open up and in the absence of people opening up, and the absence of people not being overwhelmed by the experience, we don't have the ability in the dining room to genuinely connect with them. So the conversation the two of us had that first day is, hey, we need to go deeper in the casualness of our service. And that's not to say that we don't you know, follow the rules. We've spent our entire careers learning the rules. We intend to follow them. But what it does mean is that um, we aspire to read the guest, get to know where they're at, invite them in, compel them to let their guard down so that we can develop the kind of relationship we really want. And how do you do that in with such short notice and with uh, varying degrees of openness on the part of the guests to, to being read, to being uh, addressed in a casual way? They're, they're there for different reasons. They have different moods. H how do you empower and enable your team to sort of read the room correctly or read a guest correctly? I think it starts with just being present at the table. We talk a lot about that idea, about um, this idea that being present is about caring uh, so much on the thing that you're doing that you don't actually care about all the things you need to do. I believe that if you're truly present with the people that you're with, if you're not concerned about all the other tables you need to tend to such that you're invested completely in the one you're with at that time, you can get enough of a sense of where they're at that you can adapt what you're doing um, to, to suit them. We, we have this thing uh, that we say called earning informality. And we say it for a couple different reasons. Um, and actually, the first time I feel like I connected with this was at a meal that the two of us had at Tayavant. Um, it was maybe a year into our working together and we went to Tayavant. Um, and so, okay, I hadn't been to that many three Michelin star restaurants in my life. I'd worked in fine dining restaurants, but never at that level. And so the two of us, we go to Paris, we're very excited. We had no money then. I think we shared a hotel room that was half the size of the stage. We went to Taiwan and I was nervous. I was nervous because I wanted 
to impress my new business partner. I was nervous because I didn't want to like do something stupid in the restaurant. And we walk in and they uh, did not help the situation by they sat us side by side. <laughs> And then I, I think you'll remember this. We sat down, they came over, they poured us champagne, and I immediately knocked my, my glass of champagne over. And I was like, oh, dude, you're totally ruining this. You're ruining the whole thing. Um, but the graciousness and the, the hilarity with which they dealt with the situation was perfect. Then it got worse. Um, I had, I don't know what the deal was with my pants, but they were especially slippery. And so the napkin just kept on falling off. And you know, the napkin falls off, they go pick it up, they put down a refolded napkin. It's cool the first time, the third time it happens, you just realize you're like that idiot American in the, in the Parisian three-star restaurant. So the third time they came over, and every time I try to make a joke about it, I, I was showing them the personality that I had and inviting them to drop the formality a little bit and engage with me at the level I wanted to be engaged with. Um, the third time they came over, they brought a new napkin and a clothespin on top of the napkin. Oh. <laughs> In a nice way, or? And it, but it was like perfect, like serious look with just a little half smirk. Yeah. And it was perfect. A, I, I didn't drop the napkin again, but B, it, it made me feel so much more at ease and at home and welcome. They, they worked with me, they were present with me, they listened to the words that I was using, and they took a little bit of a hospitable leap of faith, um, maybe venturing beyond uh, the normal air of formality expected from a restaurant like that, because they knew that that was what I needed to receive. They had the clothespin there. They, I guess they had a clothespin, I don't know, or maybe they went to some, someone to buy it. No, I think that, that must be the hardest thing, is to sort of look at a diner who you, you don't know much about, uh, try to judge their their situation, their mood. I was at a uh, uh, a, a set menu restaurant uh, recently, and they brought over a tightly coiled little uh, hot towel to begin with, and sort of presented it in this very sort of uh, formal way. And I made a stupid joke and asked if the chef suggested I take it in one bite. And the the guy just did not roll with my d bad dad joke. Um, he was just sort of, he clearly, I mean, it's a terrible joke, but he clearly was just not ready to go off script. So how do you script going off script? Okay, so I, we believe that people do not want to be served by the people from Downton Abbey. That old school, like uber formal, ultra serious approach to service, it just doesn't work anymore. Um, we believe that people want to be served by awesome people who just know more about whatever they're experiencing than they do. And that's what we try to encourage. Um, it is a tricky thing um, because inevitably we are in a human business. At 11 Madison Park, there's 150 people. It's a lot easier to make sure that you are executing your vision if you have a lot of rules. The less rules you have, the more challenging it becomes. The more you have to trust people, the more likely you are to be disappointed once in a while. But allowing yourself to be disappointed is a really important thing because the other 99 times you're actually hitting it out of the ballpark. When I say earn informality, th what, what that means to us is two things. Um, I believe, okay, a rule in service. As a server, you're never supposed to put your hands on the table. I love- Or the guest. What's that? Or the guest. Or, yeah, I mean, the guests can do what they want, but. <laughs> Sorry, I, I missed the joke. Yeah. Was it a dad joke? It was as bad as, yeah, as bad as it might. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of them here, actually. So. Is that just a thing? You have a kid and the jokes get bad? All right. Um, I believe in putting your hands on the table. And that's just something that I take very, very seriously. And when I first got there, some of the other managers at 11 Madison Park were mortified because I was their boss and I was putting my hands on the table and they would go back and run and, <laughs> and complain to Daniel that I was doing it. But I believe that the connection between the server and the guest is the most important thing. It's more important than any rule I've ever been taught. And if I can break down the boundary between me and the people I'm trying to serve through a physical gesture, such as actually connecting their world to mine, that's a very powerful thing. That said, you can't just roll up and do whatever you want. You need to earn the right to do it. You need to connect with them and encourage them and go along just a little step by a little step until you recognize that you've been given permission. But the other thing we say to our staff is not only do you need to earn informality to bring it, you need to get there. 
Because genuine connection does not come when you're in an environment that's overly formal. Genuine connection only comes when people let their guards down enough to allow you to get in there. And that is an inherently informal uh, environment, I, I think. And so if the, the new room and the, and the new menu and the new look and feel has sort of become slightly more perfect, more, maybe more formal, have, how do you adjust the other way? How do you put people at ease? Because it sounds like that's a lot of what you're saying is put the diner at ease. Well, okay, I think to give you a very simple example, uh, the volume with which we talk, uh, there is nothing less satisfying or hospitable or warm or welcoming than when you go to a restaurant and you feel the compulsion to whisper. I just don't think that's cool. Um, we don't believe that music should have a huge role in our restaurant, but it's played at a volume such that if you're one of the first tables in the room, you don't feel the need to whisper. But we were sitting in our restaurant and suddenly we were whispering to each other. And the reason we were whispering is because the staff was so in awe of this beautiful new room that they were whispering. So the next day we said, guys, just talk louder. Because if the room gets a little more energy, then people will never feel they're in an overly precious thing. It's not meant to be a temple. It's meant to feel like an extension of someone's home, just like a really, really awesome home. <laughs> because it's about pleasure. It's about enjoyment. And it's not necessarily about genuflecting to genius no offense uh but it's you you're there for you know for for uh, an extensive stay and you should be ha you're paying for the right to be there so you should be happy to be there i guess i'm just curious how if i was opening up uh, you know 12 madison park what advice would you give me to to sort of get to that point where i'm reading a, a guest correctly because not not everyone in that room wants the music not everyone on, some people want to whisper because they've this is this is a special occasion for them some people you know, want to have a more uh, lively uh, environment. We, we, the way we talk about it a lot is um, like when you meet your girlfriend's dad for the first time. You say like, hello, Mr. Sachs, nice to meet you. But then you want to interact with them in such a way where eventually you're like, hey, call me Adam. <laughs> right, but you need to be brought there. And, and the way that you get there is by, you know, it's like anything. I think we all have the ability to read people. We've all done it a thousand times, perhaps not in the dining room environment. But we've all developed a friendship. And in a friendship, you start out, you're kind of testing the waters, you're seeing where they're at. We've all done it on a first date. We've all, I think it's just about, um, like anything, you want to develop a relationship. You listen, you respond, you read the guest, um, and you pick up on little ticks or clues or, or whatever you need to such that you can actually engage in something deeper than one person serving another person. In the previous panel, Alex used the analogy of uh, sort of locking into a fine dining experience as sort of getting onto a, a roller coaster and you're, you're locked in for better or for worse. We've all been uh, it sat through dinners where the car goes off the rails. Um, how have you had any bumps along the way in, in, in learning to be casual, learning uh, earning informality? Oh, for sure. I mean... Listen, we're, what we're trying to do, I, I think, in many ways, is very new. We're, our, our mission statement when we first got to the restaurant was we wanted to create a four-star restaurant for our generation. Um, all the restaurants that we came up uh, just in awe of were still crushing it, but no one was opening new four-star restaurants. Everyone was opening uh, like counter restaurants with no reservations and no backs, and the service was almost being like taken away from the from the equation um, and the reason was was because people thought that was cooler we needed to figure out a way to make our version of fine dining just as cool albeit different um, and uh, as in, in pursuit of that as important as the script is it's going off script that helps to make that happen um, but uh, for sure there's people that have come to our restaurant and maybe not as much people from America, but people from Europe who experience some of our things and see some of our courses or some of the steps of service we do, and they are just offended. <laughs> They're just offended. In the beginning, we didn't actually understand the importance of earning the informality. We would just go right in and give it. And that was a hard lesson for us for a while because some people, it's about identifying what it is that the guest wants to receive and doing your best to give them that. But if you don't first realize that different people are looking for different experiences and you just try to give everyone this kind of like downtown four-star experience, you're going to rub people the wrong way. 
one size fits one is this thing that an old mentor of mine named Richard Corain uh, taught me, and it, and it really is true. You can't try to be the same thing to everyone that you're welcoming into the restaurant. Uh, step back for a moment and tell me wh why, why do all this? Why not just have a counter? Why not drop perfect food and walk away? We all have I wouldn't people have who a job. Pretend <laughs> we all have people who will pretend to be our friends for a couple hours. Why, why not just let them talk to their friends and, and have great food? What, 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 are you, what is this thing that, you're, that you value and that you want to see thrive? We, uh, we have a meeting at 11 Madison Park at the beginning of every year. Uh, it's a strategic planning meeting where we get our entire team together. Uh, Daniel and I lay out the mission statement for everything that we want to accomplish in the year to come, and then we come up with a list of, of, of to-do items, basically. Ideas for courses, steps of service, new cultural ideas. Um, but the first time we did it, we first needed to decide what we wanted to embody. And that day we came up with a lot of stuff that has really fueled the restaurant ever since. But the last thing we, we, we did that day was we named something um, that was pretty simple and perhaps almost obvious, but it was something we decided we needed to name for ourselves, and that was that we believe in the absolute and inherent nobility of our work. I think it's so important that you name for yourself that your work is important, because if you don't really believe that, if you wait for other people to tell you that, you'll never be as good at it um, as, as we obviously want to be. And the reason we believe in the nobility of our work is because we get to create this place where people come to celebrate some of the most important moments of their lives, where they come in an effort to give themselves the grace to forget some of the most challenging ones. Um, we give them an opportunity to celebrate human connection. Um, we have this opportunity to create a magical world in a, a place that definitively needs a little more magic. And I believe that these days, more than ever, with cell phones and technology, the world is an amazing place. Knowledge is at our fingertips all the time. But one of the things that we are craving more powerfully than ever before is human connection. And if we can create an environment where that is facilitated and encouraged, that's a beautiful thing. The food is a big part of it, but everything that we do in the dining room is a really big part of it too. And I don't believe that you can actually encourage that depth of relationship without the people in the dining room um, there to make it happen. Yeah, well, it would be, I mean, we've been to those restaurants. That's a, it's an entirely different product and it's an entirely different experience. And I think we're all here because we do believe in, in this idea of fine dining and its, its role in the future. And, and because it is this magical experience, it's this sustained uh, moment of pleasure that's very different than our day-to-day -day sort of, you know, however you're just eating for fuel or even just eating good, ingredi or good ingredients that have been turned into decent food, but you're not having this restaurant experience, which I think is the fascinating thing about what you all have been able to achieve. So that idea of a of, of four-star restaurant for your generation, that, talk for a second about how, how does that differ from a four-star restaurant of your dad's generation and how do you what steps do you take to sort of make sure that it's alluring and interesting to the pleasure seeker and food nerd of the future um i think first and foremost it starts with taking what we do very very seriously without taking ourselves very seriously we like to have fun i want to have fun at work i work way too much not to have fun and if we're having fun the guest is going to have fun I mean, there, there are the little things. I remember the day after we got four stars, we got rid of the dress code. Um, because I'm not necessarily comfortable having a four-hour meal in a suit and tie. I'd rather be dressed more comfortably than that. And so we got rid of that. There's things like that. But I think the big thing is the, the fact that we give the people who work for us the ability to improvise, the fact that we encourage that ability, the fact that it's almost a responsibility for them too. Um, we go off script all the time. We have served hot dogs from the street, plated beautifully as a course because we heard them mention it offhand. And we like to tell jokes in like the most hilarious ways. We've, uh, you know, we've had sleds in an SUV outside of the restaurant to bring someone to Central Park because a family from Spain said that their kids were seeing it snow for the first time. We've turned our private dining room into a hockey rink. Um, 
we've put Cindy Crawford posters in place of our Miles Davis posters in the kitchen because one guy had an obsession with Cindy Crawford. Um, we allow our staff to call someone dude in the dining room if they believe they've been invited to do that. Um, What's the sign? <laughs> well, generally they call you dude and then you just use it right back. Because that's the thing, like you need to get off the pretense of sir and madame and all of this. Because listen, people want to laugh, they want to love, they want to experience life in its most like fully realized state. And the only way to do that is if you feel at home. We talk a lot about like finding a balance between going out and coming home. At the end of the day, we want EMP to feel like coming home to people because that's when people have the ability to relax and open up. Um, obviously, it's going out. You're eating his food. You're having a, a wine list this thick. We're opening bottles with fire, and there's plate of this and table side that. And, um, but the coming home is in that final human touch, um, in welcoming people into your restaurant as if you would welcome friends into your house. Uh, we do simple things, like we get all the computers out of the way. I think Alex put it really beautifully in the idea that removing any transactional feeling from the experience is probably one of the most important first steps that you can take to delivering something world class. Um, I think it's about having rules, encouraging people to break them, trusting your team, and letting them go off the path and pushing them back on as opposed to keeping the guardrails so high that they never get close enough to falling off. You talking about the importance of uh, the staff having ple take, taking pleasure in what they do, having fun. We've all, uh, all of us here who aren't professional chefs, have uh, cooked at home, had a planned a dinner party. I have screaming matches with my spouse before our you know four year old's birthday party because the food isn't quite right. And then you question like what what is it? Why are we doing this? Uh, talk about that. What they were talking about in the previous panel, this idea that to to sustain fine dining. There needs to be a, a do or die ethos in the kitchen. Is that something that has to happen? It just has to stay behind closed doors? Or have you guys found a way to sort of evolve that a little bit? No, I mean, I don't believe that it's a zero sum game. Um, we look at it a couple different ways. When we first bought the restaurant, we had a meeting with this guy named Chris Canlis, who's the second generation owner of a restaurant called Canlis in Seattle. And I'm going to give you two kind of. Uh, contradictory ideas that, and we somehow have managed to live by both of them. Um, he said, in life, most people will tell you to separate life from work, that the best way to be happy is to keep work over here and life over here. He said, in our business, you need to allow them to kind of blend into each other and to be one and the same. Otherwise, you're always going to feel guilty when you're doing one that you're not doing the other and vice versa. And to live with a sense of perpetual guilt is the worst thing ever. Um, I think that was really good advice, and we've tried to live by it. But on the other hand, uh, we do believe very strongly in the importance of compartmentalizing things. That when you do walk through the doors of 11 Madison Park to work, you have a responsibility to the people you're working with and to the guests you're serving. And if you are having some challenging stuff, you need to leave it at the door. That's not to say that the people you work with can't help you through things and coach you alongside them, uh, but leaving things outside is important. Along that same idea, we have a cultural thing that we, we, we use as we train our staff called oxygen mask. And it's inspired by when you get on the plane and uh, the, the warnings come on and they're like, if those little masks drop from the ceiling, the oxygen masks, and you have an infant child, put yours on first and then the baby's. And every time, I remember when I first heard that, I was like, are you crazy? I'm going to let my child die? Um, but there's logic to it. You need to actually, we're all in a business where we are constantly giving of ourselves, emptying our gas tanks to fill up the gas tanks of others. Um, and so we talk all the time about the need to invest in ourselves first such that we can come into work and then invest in all the people that walk through our doors. And so I don't think it's all or nothing. Daniel is a runner. That's how he fills his oxygen tank. I love playing music. That's how I fill mine. I think you need to have a life outside of the restaurant in order to maintain a consistent enough perspective that you're able to innovate within the restaurant. And a key element of that, I think, is the compartmentalizing, it, you mentioned, is just to not 
it's a stressful business, but your guests or your customers don't pass that stress on to them. You know, in the magazine, we don't write stories about how hard it is to write stories that would be get old pretty quickly. Um, I think that must be the hardest thing, though, is not is just sort of not letting them see you sweat. <laughs> it's funny. I was in Chicago at the James Beard Awards, and Daniel was speaking on a panel, and it was him and three other chefs. And it was like the guy was asking some question. Do you remember this? And every chef was like, yeah, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. And then it got to Daniel. He's like, can you guys stop talking about how hard life is? We all have awesome restaurants and we're doing great. Life's amazing. Stop it. And I agree. It's not hard. We, like, I, I, I believe that there are, we chose this because we love it and we're passionate about it. And I can't imagine doing anything else. I think there are people that like to give and there are people that like to receive. Inevitably, um, they're both just as selfish as the other. I like to give, but the act of giving for me is in itself receiving. Um, if I'm having a hard time in life, when I walk onto that floor and I get to play restaurant every single night, that is the most enriching and fulfilling thing I can do because I get to give these experiences to so many people. It actually can be your medicine if you look at it through the right lens. I think that's a really nice spot to end on and a nice summation of what you guys do so well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.